many of you have ever had the opportunity to start your own school from the ground up? Some, someone just said, hey, here's some money, start a school. Oh, you have, Bob. Okay, great. And that is honestly what happened to me last year. Um, and so my talk about finding Finland was my uh, journey through setting up a school from the ground up, looking at rules, what rules can I break, which ones can I keep. Um, so really quickly about my story and how I got here and how it ties into Array. Um, so I was born and raised here in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, this is home. Uh, and I was unfortunately that kid in high school that wanted to leave. You know, Wyoming wasn't cool enough. And so I, I graduated, left, and I ended up working for Apple for about eight and a half years. And it was the best job in the world. I did people uh, enrichment, personal development, training. And obviously, my passions always lied in storytelling, art, and technology. Um, and so Apple was the perfect fit for me. Uh, and the real moment in my life that everything that's happened since the catalyst was when Steve Jobs passed away. And I just knew losing someone like Steve um, was hard. And I knew I wanted to kind of do my own thing. And I was personally inspired by him when he gave his, uh, his speech at uh, Stanford University. He talked about what it's like to really face death. And when you face death, you don't regret the things that you did. You regret the things that you di didn't do. You know, not starting your own company or spending more time with your family. And that really stuck with me. So I decided, you know what, it's, it's been time enough. Maybe I want to come home. I've been away from Wyoming for 10 plus years. So I came back to hometown. I moved back to Cheyenne in July of 2014, got involved with Bob. And they had this crazy idea that they wanted to start technology in a coding school. And I was like, I'm all about that. Because typically in Wyoming, we're not known for technology and design. You know, I mean, when you look at uh, the, our state, I mean, we are the least populated state in the nation. We have 585,000 people uh, in 2015, and so there's actually more of these uh, than there are uh, people. And so Wyoming generally is known for uh, exactly this, you know. When you drive into Wyoming, we're greeted with Forever West, and so we're kind of cowboys and Western culture and a really great hospitality, and there's a lot about that that I love. Uh, but also at the same time, you know, I'm more of the digital cowboy, kind of the next generation of what we want to do here uh, in Wyoming. And I just loved the idea that we were going to start something super cool right here in Cheyenne. Because as some of the speakers have mentioned prior, those of us who live here in Wyoming know the struggles that we currently face uh, with our economy. And what are we going to do about it? We know that we have to have a long-term solution to these problems. Um, and so basically, I knew how important this job was of starting the school, and immediately, has anyone ever experienced this before? Imposter syndrome, which uh, I, I was paralyzed with fear the first part of last year, because I'm sitting there thinking to myself, like, I've never started a school before. Why did they pick me? Uh, I don't even have a college degree. I, I graduated from high school. I, why? Why me? And, and uh, Wikipedia defines imposter syndrome as uh, the phenomenon, imposter phenomenon or fraud syndrome is a concept describing high achieving individuals who are marked by the inability to internalize their accomplishments and persistent fear of being exposed as a fraud. Uh, despite external evidence of their competence, those exhibiting uh, the syndrome remain convinced that they are frauds and do not deserve the success that they have achieved. Proof of success is dismissed as luck, timing, or as a result of deceiving others into thinking that they are more intelligent and competent than they believe themselves to be. And that's exactly how I felt. I was worried Bob was going to find out that I'm really not this smart guy at all. And like, why do we choose him to be this headmaster of the school? And in initially, after getting over that paralyzing fear, I began my work in setting up this school. So the first question I asked myself was, is there one school that... I admired, and maybe that would be a really great starting point to setting it all up. And immediately, as soon as I asked that question in my head, it c came to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hogwarts! So, I'm a self-proclaimed Harry Potter fan. I love Harry Potter. One of the things I loved about Hogwarts specifically uh, was that the building's alive. It's got moving portraits and staircases. But more importantly, what I loved about Hogwarts was this, the fictional students there loved going to Hogwarts. It was home. It was a place for them. It was a safe place for them. And so there's only so many things that I could take from a fictional school like Hogwarts. So I had to do my due diligence, and we had to go and do some market research. So we visited coding schools in Colorado. Uh, we've, we've continued that journey from New York City. And what we found most of these coding schools look like is they offer anywhere from 12 to 24-week programs. 
um, and their, their goal is to get you trained in technology and then to get you a tech job and to do this in a really short time frame, like 12 or 24 weeks. Well, you can imagine the list of technologies and programming languages that we have to fill in this tiny time to make sure they can get jo uh, jobs in technology. It's a daunting task, so you know, this basically most of these schools are set up eight to five. Uh, they kind of uh, recommend about 10 to 20 hours of homework every day. Basically, some of these schools have these like fear factors. They're kind of like, get ready for the hardest seven months of your life. You're gonna have no social life, but it's gonna be worth it. You know, so I'm like, well, okay. And it made sense to me because we had so much to cover in a short amount of time. Yeah, we have to like go, go, go. We have to have homework because the ultimate goal is to get these people jobs. Then my world came crashing down because in March, I just happened to come across this documentary that was talking about the Finnish education system and how Finland is regarded as the world's best education system out there on planet Earth. Um, and so I watched this documentary and literally after I watched it, my gray matter was all over the walls. I was just like, this doesn't make any sense. It defies gravity. But when you look at the data of what Finland has been able to do in the last 30 years, Finland has consistently, their students, their teenagers are top 10 in the world when it comes to math, reading and science. So to kind of take a look at that, um, there is an international standards test that happens. Uh, every three years it's called PISA, which stands for Program, uh, Program for International Student Assessment. And this was some of the data that came out of the PISA results just in 2015. So let's first take a look at the math results. So the average of so the scale is zero to a thousand, thousand being perfect. The world average was 490. Uh, Finland got 511, ranking them 11th in the world in math, and the USA at 470 at number 39. Uh, when we look at science, the world average was 493. Finland was 531, number five in the world when it came to their students knowing math and, and the stuff they need to be successful. In the USA, just slightly above world average at number 24. And lastly, in reading, 493, the world average, Finland, 526, number four in the world when it comes to reading, and the United States, 497, number 24. So when I looked at this, obviously it was clear to me, something's not working. You know, if we're consistently, as a country, floating in the 30s and 24, th th something is fundamentally broken. Is there something here that we could disrupt education? And so that was kind of our mission was, you know, the education system here is ripe for disruption. It is time to rethink how we engage our K through 12 and beyond in computer science and technology. Because as you all know, technology isn't going anywhere, right? So there were four things that I found that the Finnish education system did that was really unique. First one was trust. Trust started from the very top. So A, being a professor in Finland is regarded as one of the highest level professions that you can have. Teachers are revered. And it is something that you work your entire life to hopefully become a teacher in the Finnish education system. Uh, the, the administration sets out a bunch of standards, but then trusts every single school in Finland to design their own curriculum, so completely not micromanaging them, to do what, a, what they need for their students to hit those benchmarks and those standards. Um, the other thing that was really shocking is the lecture workshop model. So in Finland, what from research shows us, your brain is most ready to take in new information in the morning. But what study also shows that in the afternoon, your brain kind of starts turning off and discards stuff. So they only do lecture in the mornings, and then they switch to a project hands-on type thing in the afternoons. Made sense. One of the other things I was like, this is crazy. In Finland, there is no homework. No homework. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> When you think about this, A, as a student, when you were a student, did you like homework? No. Uh, as a teacher, did you like grading papers? No. So that was the thing. Question everything. Why is there homework? Is it really that valuable that we're spending 10 or 20 hours a week doing something repetitive? Is there a lot of value to it? The Finns found there's not. What they found was the most important thing was work-life balance. So in Finland, they have two-hour lunches. Uh, again, very little homework, if any at all. And Finland really wants their students to be kids. You finish school, go play with your friends, go do your chores, cook, clean. The idea was to pull yourself away, refresh, so that when you come back the next morning, you'd be really good to go. So I'm just sitting there like, this sounds amazing. I, oh, I am terrified to go in front of my board directors and say, uh, so I want two-hour lunches. I'm not going to do any homework. 
Uh, we're going to only be lecturing like 10 hours a week, and I promise we're going to teach these people how to code, and they're going to get great jobs. You know, and I was really fortunate that my board did have some googly eyes at the beginning, but they agreed that, you know, this was worth the risk. If this worked, this would be incredible. And one of my favorite quotes is actually Gandhi that says, you know, be the change that you want to see in the world. And so I was like, well, if we can just prove this concept, we can move it from Finland, bring it here to Wild West Wyoming, and if it works, maybe we can lead by example. Maybe we can show that these crazy concepts actually worked. So with a little hesitation, October 3rd of last year, this was the first day at Array, you know? And so we were, <laughs> oh, I love these guys so much. Uh, and the students knew, they knew that we were gonna do things differently um, and that we're gonna have two hour lunches, but if we didn't get through the curriculum in time that we knew we kind of have to probably change things, I had no idea how it was gonna pan out. Well anyway, school went on in our six month program and it was about February 3rd that things started to really click for me. So the first indication that things were working, we actually finished a month and a half early. <laughs> yeah, which blew my mind. I mean, we're teaching them HTML, CSS, JavaScript, APIs. We coded Amazon Dash buttons. We built a Raspberry Pi weather station. I mean, we did so much. And the feedback we got from the students, we were really strict about, take your two-hour lunch. You know, this gives you time not to run to a fast food joint and get something and run back to the school. Two hours is plenty of time for you to go home, cook a fresh meal, maybe run to the grocery store really quick. No homework. What we found our students did, they created their own homework because they were so excited about what they were learning in the morning. They're like, oh my gosh, we learned this cool thing about JavaScript. They went and self, you know, assigned themselves homework. That's the best kind of homework we could ask for. But the beauty about that was it didn't come from me. And if there was a night that maybe they weren't in the mood to do homework, they didn't have to feel obligated, right, that, oh, my gosh, i got to get this done, and I have to have this up to ET by 9 a.m. the next day. There was none of that. Um, so some of the other results, so this is actually near the end of our program. Uh, so in retrospect, we had seven students, you know, and this was a hard sell. We're starting a new school. I'm like, hey, come, we're going to teach you code. We have no track record, but just trust us. Trust us. You know, and I love that model because going back to the Finnish education system, the foundation of our school at Array had to be in trust. The board had to trust me to run the school. I need to be able to trust my professor, Professor Sanderlin, and in turn, I need to trust the students to do what's expected of them. Uh, so they graduated April 1st of this year. Four out of our seven students were already full-time employed in the technology industry before graduation, uh, which is incredible. Uh, four out of seven. All of these guys went to go work in the, Wyo the new up-and-coming Wyoming technology workforce. Most of them are making more money than they ever had in their lives because this, this, this demand for coding and design skills. Uh, we have recently just placed our two more, so we have one left, um, and these guys really proved our, our business model. So what we're doing here, we're doing some really amazing things. And what I want you guys to take away with you uh, is question everything. Why are we doing it this way? Is there a better way? Uh, thank you. Question everything, because that's exactly what I did when I set up this school. The easy road when setting up a new school was to go back to what other coding schools were doing, you know, the 60-hour work weeks, the 10 to 20 hours of homework. A, the evidence was already there that they were successful, so the easy road was just to kind of build our school in that way. The difficult road and the more rewarding road was saying, I want to start a school based in Hogwarts and Finland. Um, and it's a combination of a Willy Wonka chocolate factory and Apple. You know, uh, and I hope that this all works out and I still have a job at the end of the day. Uh, and it worked. Um, so the last thing is, and kind of ending you with a quote, with my kind of uh, fictional role model, Dumbledore. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from Dumbledore was, we must all face the choice between what is right and what is easy. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a great evening. <laughs>